Lenin said, we communists must use one country against another in order to gain strength as rapidly as possible. As soon as we are strong enough to defeat capitalism as a whole, we shall immediately take it by the scruff of the neck. Stalin stated, the victory of socialism in one country is not a self-sufficient task. It is at the same time the beginning of and the groundwork for the world revolution. Khrushchev declared, through the formation of the world system of socialism, the situation in the world has altered radically. At present, it is not known who encircles whom. Khrushchev's words have direct bearing on the lives of every man, woman, and child in the world. This map reveals, in the black area, the 28 territories and countries subjugated by a relatively few communists since 1917. During this period, as this map shows, 42 nations and territories attained independence and the right of self-determination through policies pursued by the free world. We present the history of the major threat to the world today, communist imperialism. Hello, my name is Harry Von Zell. I'm your narrator for this subject. We can learn much about socialist communism merely by watching and listening to the communists themselves. History proves that communism does not recognize basic moral virtues. On the thinking of communism, let me quote Joseph Stalin. Words must have no relation to actions. Otherwise, what kind of diplomacy is it? Words are one thing, actions another. Words are a mask for concealment of bad deeds. Sincere diplomacy is no more possible than dry water or wooden iron." End quote. Communism follows the strategy of directly reversing the truth, of constantly pointing the finger of accusation at those who oppose them to divert attention from their own gross violations of trust. In this film you will see stark examples of the sheer treachery and deceit practiced by communists in pursuit of their goal to enslave the world's people. And now, may I introduce, as your guide through the picture, the Vice President of Pepperdine College of Los Angeles, Mr. William J. T. Rare film footage recently obtained from behind the Iron Curtain exposes the true significance of the promises and alleged good intentions of the Communists. The film sequences have been determined by treaty date. In the manifesto of the Communist Party, as written by Marx and Engels, we read this quote. Communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions, unquote. Governed by Lenin's theory that freedom must be extinguished in order for communism to exist, the Reds have been at war with the free world. Lenin warned his disciples and again, I quote, In war, never tie your hands with consideration of formality. It is ridiculous not to know that a treaty is the means of gaining strength, unquote. Let's see how the communists put the so-called science of Marxism-Leninism to work for them. Note, if you will, the involvement of Khrushchev in the Ukraine and the key role he plays with Stalin as they move forward in the chronology of communist imperialism. In 1939, the question of war or peace to a great extent depends on the Soviets. Stalin negotiates with France and England on a common anti-Hitler front, and at the same time he is negotiating with Hitler on a non-aggression pact. Nazi Germany's foreign minister von Ribbentrop comes to Moscow to confer with Maxim Litvinov, Soviet commissar of foreign affairs, regarding the agreement. Later, the new Soviet foreign minister, Molotov, goes to Berlin for further conferences with the Nazis. August 23, 1939, the Stalin-Hitler Pact is announced, and the Red Army invades eastern Poland, bringing on World War II. Columnists come out of hiding ready to do their part in consolidating the takeover. These are some of the 250,000 prisoners of war being sent to Russia. 
Later, in 1943, the discovery of a mass grave of some 15,000 Polish officers and intellectual leaders executed by the Reds in the Katyn Forest near Smolensk is announced. Stalin stages a mass meeting to greet communist representatives of the allegedly liberated Western Ukraine and Belarusia, who asked to be accepted into the Soviet Greater Ukraine. This parade is ordered to celebrate the incorporation of Eastern Poland into the USSR and is in honor of Nikita Khrushchev, key troubleshooter for Stalin, now the new secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Ukraine. Khrushchev falsely declares, our political positions are well known. We have held and hold to the position of non-intervention in the internal affairs of other countries. The example of Finland. November 30th, 1939, grossly violating their non-aggression pact of 1932, Russian planes without warning or provocation bomb Helsinki, signaling the Red Army's ruthless aggression. Some 400,000 displaced Finns move their possessions by every possible means of transportation. The 8 million Finns are heroic in the defense of their freedom against 170 million Russians, but the Soviet-Finnish war ends with the ceding of Finnish Karelia to Russia. The example of Latvia. Also in 1939, under Soviet threat, Latvian borders are forced open. On promise of friendship, Moscow gets bases. On June 16, 1940, the Soviets issue an ultimatum, submit to occupation or be attacked. On June 17, the Red Army, in direct violation of previous treaties, moves in to complete the occupation of Latvia. From Russia, to initiate the new order, comes Andrei Vyshinsky to appoint a puppet government. With August Kirstenstein as prime minister, Russian technicians are sent in with the troops. Banners and signs prepared by subversives demand admittance of Latvia into the Soviet Union. In July, Johannes Spuris, second secretary of the Latvian Communist Party, makes the formal request of the parliament. Proceedings are watched carefully by the Soviet secret police. There are no opposing votes. On August 3rd, Kirshenstein leaves Riga with a delegation of Latvian communists for the Moscow Supreme Soviet. Stalin and company applaud the Latvian communist delegates. In the background is Marshal Timoshenko. Kirstenstein petitions for acceptance of Latvia as a Soviet state. In addition to Stalin are Khrushchev, Molotov, Mikoyan, and Koganovich. Kirstenstein speeds home to be welcomed by Soviet troops, his new guard of honor. The red flag flies over Latvia. We are reminded of an item in Molotov's speech to the Supreme Soviet in 1939, quote, the nonsensical talk about the Sovietization of the Balkan countries, as some of organs of the foreign press charge, is only to the interest of our common enemies. The new constitution sent from Moscow guarantees freedom from unreasonable arrest, unquote. However, enough reasonable charges are found to send thousands of Latvian men, women, and children to slave labor camps in the Soviet Union. On this list are the names of 78 people arrested by the NKVD, Soviet secret police. The notation at the end of the list explains the quite reasonable charges. Not politically reliable, shoot them to death. The example of Estonia. Also in 1939, with more promises, the Soviet Union requests these bases. The little country accedes. In June of 1940, the Red Army invades Estonia on the pretext that Soviet soldiers stationed there have not been assured proper security. Less than a month later, a new Communist Constituent Assembly holds its first session. Key Communists, indoctrinated in special schools in Moscow, exhort the populace to accept the party as their masters. Typically, a vote of confidence for the one-party ticket is ordered. Another victory parade for a new Moscow-approved puppet government. Estonia succumbs to communist imperialism. The example of Romania, June 28, 1940. 
Leftist underground workers who prepared the way welcomed the invasion of the Red Army into Romania. Russia demands Bessarabia and northern Bukovina. Romania is powerless to resist. Romanian soldiers are evacuated to slave labor camps in the Soviet Union. The red flag flies over eastern Romania. Stalin's advance agents Khrushchev and Commissar of Defense Timoshenko organize the local communists. Khrushchev congratulates the Romanians on their liberation and assures them, quote, the Soviet government does not pursue the aim of changing the social systems existing in Romania, end quote. As you just witnessed, the communists took Lenin at his word that a treaty is the means of gaining strength. Beginning with the first treaty by the Soviets in 1920, the communists recognized the independence and made alliances with their neighbors to gain time in order to marshal the resources and energies of the 170 million Russians to build a powerful military force. When they felt they were strong enough, they systematically and immediately gobbled up their neighbors. The Reds found that in most cases, just the threat of Soviet power was enough to gain their ends. Karl Marx, one of the original architects of the communist theory, said, and we quote, the Russian bear is certainly capable of anything, as long as he knows the other animals he has to deal with are capable of nothing, unquote. Communist imperialism was on the march when these things happened. On June 22, 1941, Hitler, without warning, turns his forces against his pact partner, Stalin. Thus threatened, Stalin seeks a treaty of friendship and mutual assistance with the government in exile of the country he had previously violated, Poland. On December 5, 1941, General Sikorsky, shown here, executes the agreement. Stalin promises a free and independent Poland after the war to Sikorsky. Stalin joins the Allies, pledging, quote, We shall give the liberated peoples of Europe the full right of freedom to decide for themselves the question of their own form of government, end quote. Behind the scenes, Stalin grooms his future puppets, the Lublin Committee, made up of Polish communists who are laying the groundwork for the re-takeover of their country. The war is over, and with red troops on Polish soil, Polish communists sign a pact with the Kremlin on August 15, 1945. Molotov signs for the USSR. Stalin's promises at Yalta and to General Sikorsky to ensure free and unfettered elections in Poland have already been dishonored in an occupied Poland whose key figures, Galuka, Radkowicz, Berman, and Beirut, are trained in Moscow agents. The example of Czechoslovakia, December 1943. Zenik Ferlinger, ambassador to Russia in the Czech government in exile, signs a mutual assistance treaty with the Soviets as his president, Benis, looks on. These people are Tanu Tuvinians. August 17, 1944, the Tuvinian People's Republic requests incorporation into the USSR. Today, their existence is utterly denied by the Soviet Union. Albania. By November 29, 1944, communist subversion under Red Leader Anvo Hoxha results in only one governing party being recognized in Albania, the Albanians' Workers' Party, the Communist Party. An insight into communist philosophy is the dove of peace and Soviet military might usually seen together in communist parades and rallies. This is Mukden, Manchuria, destroyed after six months of Soviet and Chinese liberation. These are Manchurian factories after systematic stripping by the Soviets. Khrushchev declared, quote, our state has categorically refused all that rests on loot, violence, and occupation, end quote. Here is grim evidence to the contrary. This is only one of the many incidents of wanton looting, plundering, and dismantling for removal to Russia of industrial plants. The example of Mongolia. This Mongolian official is Choi Balsan, an agent of the Kremlin. He is ordered to Moscow to ask for formal incorporation of Outer Mongolia into the USSR. The example of Yugoslavia. In May 1946, Stalin summons to Moscow Communist Tito, head of the Federal People's Republic of Yugoslavia, to sign a treaty of mutual assistance and friendship. 
July 1946, Edward Benish returns to Prague, Czechoslovakia, from heading the government in exile during the war years. He is unanimously a re-elected president by the Constituent National Assembly. Subversive elements arrange the forming of a coalition government. And very soon, the communists become the leading party in the cabinet, headed by communist premier Clement Gottwald. Here, Gottwald denounces non-communist cabinet members before 100,000 of his party in Prague's main square. On February 22nd, communists file into the fair building in Prague where a meeting of the communist-dominated General Federation of Labor is taking place. On the speaker's stand is Premier Gottwald. Chairman of the Central Council of Czechoslovakian Trade Unions, Antonin Zapatica, reads off the communist demands. The delegates vote. Two committee members have the courage to abstain. It is noted by the Soviet secret police. This whistle signals the beginning of the communist call strike to compel President Benes to accede to their demands. All business shuts down. Transportation is halted. Miners leave their shacks. With the crippling nationwide strike a success, the Russian-backed communist leaders force President Edward Benes to accept resignation of the last anti-communist members of his cabinet. And finally, Benish himself resigns. A constitution on the Soviet model, providing a one-party legislature, is established. And the communists have complete control. A bitterly disillusioned patriot, Jan Masaryk, who remained as foreign minister under the communists in a vain attempt to help his country, had this to say. It's up to us, the so-called little people. And I personally proudly claim membership in that great mass of thinking and working citizenry. Come along with us, join us. Let's criticize together. Let's make suggestions together. Let's insist on being heard. And actions are bound to follow. Truth shall conquer if we give it half a chance. I'll be seeing you. Two weeks following the communist takeover in Czechoslovakia, Jan Masaryk leaps to his death from a Prague hotel after realizing the futility of trying to do business with the communists. Former President Benes, who also learned this lesson, dies a year later of a broken heart. The stage set, Stalin beckons his Romanian puppets to Moscow for the usual formalities of requesting acceptance into the Soviet. Dr. Peter Groza, head of the communist-led coalition government, arrives with Romanian Communist Party leaders, Georges Udej and Anna Pocher. Finally, Groza signs a treaty with the Soviets on September 15, 1947. Molotov signs for the USSR. Seven months later, Romania becomes a people's democracy modeled on the Soviet system. Khrushchev's promises of keeping the status quo was nothing more than Soviet diplomacy. Words are one thing, actions another. Berlin. Following World War II, communist puppet William Peake strengthens Stalin's grip over East Germany. June 17th, 1953, the people of East Berlin rise in revolt against their red masters, demanding free elections. Nearly 100,000 angry people staged the first great popular rebellion inside the Iron Curtain. And part of the Iron Curtain is torn up. Every hated communist emblem is put to the torch. After one day of freedom, Russian military might quells the surging crowds. It is a powerful demonstration of an oppressed people risking their lives in defiance of Kremlin tyranny. The example of Hungary. Leaders of the communist subversive movement in Hungary arrive in Moscow to assure Stalin that Hungary is ready to be taken into vassalage of the Soviet Union. October 1st, 1949, Hungary becomes a popular democracy. General Secretary of the Hungarian Workers' Party, Matyas Rokosi, arrives to cast his ballot and to speak of Soviet generosity, I quote Rokosi. What was the role of the Soviet Union in the creation of a popular democracy? Without the unremitting, kind support of the Soviet Union, the Hungarian popular democracy, and I may add, all other popular democracies, would never have been created, end quote. Harping on capitalist imperialism, the Red Satirize alleged warmongers. In 1956, the world learned the meaning of the unremitting kind support of the Soviet Union. Russians, go home. The Hungarian people are in revolt. They succeed in overwhelming the Red Forces and hold the upper hand for a few days. Then 
through ruse and treachery, catching the Hungarian freedom fighters totally unaware, the Russians counterattacked to end the short-lived breath of Hungarian freedom. In view of the acts of subjugation which we have just witnessed, supervised by Khrushchev, it is difficult to understand this quote from Stalin. The people of small nations are frightened needlessly of Soviet oppression. If the Soviet Union would undertake to oppress or influence small nations, it would betray the ideology of Lenin." Unquote. Words are one thing, actions another. Lenin advised his followers, and I quote, in the last analysis, the outcome of the struggle will be determined by the fact that Russia, India, China, and so forth, constitute the overwhelming majority of the population of the globe, unquote. Communist imperialism marches on. The example of China. 1945, Molotov signs a treaty of friendship and mutual assistance with Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist representative. As this treaty is being signed, Stalin is aiding and abetting Mao Zedong's Chinese communist guerrilla army against the nationalist Chinese. In Chongqing, January 1946, General Chang Chung of the Chinese nationalists and General Chu Enlai of the communist forces meet with the United States General Marshal for a conference which culminates in the signing of a truce to cease the civil war between the nationalist government and communist guerrilla forces under Mao. It appears that Chu Enlai is having the last laugh. The Chinese communists, having gained time to build their strength, violate the truce and sweep over China. This victory parade in Shanghai is in honor of Stalin, Mao Zedong, and General Chu Te. A 50-year treaty between Red China and Russia is signed by Red China's Foreign Minister Chu Enlai in the presence of Stalin, Molotov, Boroshilov, Mikoyan, Khrushchev, and Mao. Vyshinsky signs for the Soviet Union. Stalin and Mao witnessing. The example of Korea. World War II ends with the northern part of Korea in the hands of Soviet troops. United States and Soviet representatives meet in Seoul to reach agreement on unification for Korea. But it becomes clear that the Russians, under General Redzikov, are not interested in a free united Korea, but are determined to bring the entire country under communist domination. Koreans north of the 38th parallel, the boundary line between free and communist-held Korea, hearing of the liberty and prosperity existing below the line, come in thousands to the new republic, fleeing the autocratic Communist People's Republic. In June 1950, unprovoked and without warning, a ruthless, bloody invasion of South Korea was launched by North Koreans. The lettering on this tank, however, is Russian. The United States acts quickly to check the red aggression. Subsequently, the United Nations issues a directive ordering the North Koreans to cease their unprovoked attack. The directive is ignored. The United Nations asks for additional military strength. Red China enters the war, allying herself with the North Koreans. Military setbacks and rising world indignation prompt Stalin to direct Mao to initiate peace talks in Korea. For the free world, the talks are frustrating, characterized by deliberate delays, haggling, and petty arguments by the Reds as the war rages on. Finally, Mao is recalled to Moscow by Stalin, where he is met by Molotov. This time, Mao is ordered to conclude a peace. At Panmunjom on July 27, 1953, after three years of conflict and negotiation, agreement is reached. Lieutenant General William J. Harrison of the United States signs for the United Nations. The North Korean Lieutenant General, Nami II, affixes his signature. 
The truce accomplished, these North Korean communist leaders are called to Moscow to receive instructions in carrying out a Cold War. Red Chinese troops, relieved from the Korean front, were transferred to Southeast Asia to lead wars in Vietnam and Laos. These wars were described by Khrushchev as, quote, revolutionary wars. These are not only possible, but inevitable, and will continue to get communist support. Khrushchev describes the Cuban situation as people's wars of liberation and sacred wars. Communists must not only support such wars, but lead them. Khrushchev points out, and we quote, where transition to communism meets no determined resistance, it can be brought about peacefully. Otherwise, communists must encourage armed uprising and civil war. End quote. There was no determined resistance to communism in British Guiana. The example of Georgetown, British Guiana, 1953. International communist intrigue smolders here. Britain charges a red plot as threatening the government. Accused of this conspiracy are Chetty Jagan and his wife, heads of the People's Progressive Party. Communist propaganda literature is confiscated but the communists had their foot in the door. By 1961, communist premier Chetty Jagan controls British Guiana. The example of Vietnam. July 21st, 1954 at Geneva, French General Delgier signs a ceasefire agreement with Viet Minh General Pong. Others taking part are Russia's Molotov and Viet Minh Foreign Minister Fan Van Dong. Negotiations between Red China's Chu Enlai and French Premier Mendes France achieves an armistice which brings to an end seven and a half years of fighting in Indochina. The French flag comes down. The French leave Hanoi, according to the armistice terms, and virtual control is left in the hands of Red elements. These are some of the million Vietnamese refugees fleeing the area. The Red Viet Minh Army takes over. The communist flag goes up. Proclamation and decrees of the new order are immediately posted. Cuba. The Nationalist Congress of Socialist Youth meets in Havana with the theme, Down with Yankee Imperialism, as they hail Castro's expropriation of United States holdings. Delegates are from Red China, the United States, Canada, Russia, and Romania. On December 2nd, 1961, Castro reveals, I am a Marxist-Leninist and will be one until the day I die. Socialism is a world reality today. There is no halfway between socialism and imperialism. We have been watching the communist takeover of territories and countries. While this was going on, comrades throughout the world were chorusing the charge that capitalism inevitably leads to imperialism. Now, this is like thief, crying thief. And we note that their movements followed a rather rigid pattern. There's a reason for this, because it is spelled out in the Communist International's official publication, Communist. Let's look at a few very select quotes. Immediately after the seizure of power, the Central Committee will set up a new government. It will appear democratic. Opponents of the new administration should be removed as soon as possible, but in a democratic fashion. That is to say, be brought to trial before a people's court comprised of one known member of the party and two secret members or sympathizers. The country should not apply for inclusion in the Soviet Union until they have received instructions from the common turn. Traitors are to be liquidated without trial. The term class enemy comprises the following groups. Members of ideological movements of a nationalist or religious character. Members of the police force, diplomats, civil servants, officers. Any individuals known to have opposed the revolution. We continue our quoting. Whenever necessary, representatives of the churches should be allowed to contribute in the preparation and carrying through of the revolution. Their numerical strength should determine the rate 
at which church influence is later to be eliminated from the party. End quote. The Communist International's blueprint for conquest speaks for itself. But the will for freedom cannot be chained. Let's look. The example of East Berlin. In the fall of 1961, a new version of China's Great Wall appears, separating the free West from communist-dominated East Berlin. To keep their people from temptation, the communists seek to block out the sight and sound of freedom. Speaking of the East Berlin situation, Khrushchev said, quote, The Soviet Union has diplomatic relations with all the countries of Eastern Europe and maintains most lively contacts with them. I must say that we know of no symptoms of any tensions in this area, unquote. However, at a Kremlin press conference, he changed his tune, quote, West Berlin has become a kind of cancerous tumor. If it is not liquidated, this spells a danger which might lead to quite undesirable consequences. It is just because of this that we decided to perform a surgical operation to liquidate the occupational status of Berlin, end quote. And then Khrushchev blustered, quote, we are not afraid of withdrawing our troops from all countries where they are stationed. Britain, the United States, and France fear this, end quote. Again, the finger of false accusation. The truth is that following World War II, the Allies left a temporary force of about 800,000 in Europe, whereas the Soviet maintains a standing army of five million, and their internal police armies total two million. The immoral science of socialist communist materialism is beginning to falter under the growing realization that the longing for freedom within human beings is stronger than stone barriers, sharper than barbed wire, more powerful than death itself. Here is a grim tug of war. East Berlin secret police are attempting to pull this woman back up into communist captivity. example of these East Berlin men, women, and children making their bid for freedom against all odds must inspire us to unite, to guarantee that there will always be a beacon of freedom, lighting the way out of the tyranny of communist imperialism.